And so the techniques that I use there are the same techniques I use anywhere. And so it, there's a lot of compositional techniques. I could talk about composition for hours, days, you know, weeks, months, years. I've talked about it a lot. I've got a, a video course and ebook on it. Um, and it's it's something that I'm very passionate about. And I, I really think it's very important for anyone who's doing photography to, to learn how to master composition. Uh, so I, I'm not going to delve into to that too deeply. I'll talk very generally about some of the techniques I use for landscape. And the most common technique I use, which is very common for landscape photography, is the near-far compositional style. So you find something that's close to you, and then you juxtapose that against the scenery that's in the background in a wide, typically a wide-angle composition. And so in a place like the Badlands, I will start my scouting by looking for background scenery that I really like, that I'd like to include in my final composition. And once I've selected the background and I get in the right position relative to the background, I start looking for an interesting foreground. And a foreground is going to be the, the starting point for the viewer's journey into the composition. So it's it's what invites the viewer in. It, it's the visual anchor. It's the logical starting point for the viewer to explore your composition. So it should be something that's interesting. It should be something that's compelling. It should be something that leads the eye deeper into the visual design. So I spend a lot of time looking for a compelling foreground. And uh, the foreground doesn't have to be anything big. It doesn't have to be anything super dramatic. Usually it's something that's literally at your feet. So in, in the Badlands, for example, it's eroded and cracked mud. There's all this colorful cracked mud that's all over the place. And I will get low and close to those very tiny landscape features. You know, sometimes these cracked mud tiles are maybe an inch or two across in size. But if you get really low and close with a wide angle lens, you can dramatically alter the scale of those foreground objects. You can make them look a lot bigger in the composition. So having that big foreground that's in the face of the viewer, and then having the perspective narrowing to the background. So that background feature, it just becomes the icing on the cake of your visual design. It's the cherry on top of the sundae, if you will. And so that is gonna be smaller than the space occupied by the foreground. So that narrowing of perspective will help lead the viewer's eye deeper into the composition. It will give the composition that illusion of depth and it's gonna engage the viewer's interest in that juxtaposition of foreground and background gets the viewer's eye bouncing back and forth between those two elements. If you could work in a few extra layers, like having something in the middle ground and then having some clouds in the sky above the background, that will enhance the visual interest. So that's that's really kind of the general technique I use for landscape photography is looking for that, that really compelling near far juxtaposition, trying to get that layering of visual elements from near ground to middle ground to background to sky that will just tie together the entire visual design uh, and engage the viewer's interest. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I think that's a, a really good way to do that. Uh, and kind of with those large foregrounds, you know, distant backgrounds, um, many people, many beginners, especially run into focus issues. So will you focus stack that or do you focus in a specific place or how do you deal with that big discrepancy there? Yeah. You know, when you're working with those near far compositions, usually you have a wide angle lens. So that gives you some extra depth of field uh, to play with. Um, so typically you're using a small aperture like F11 or F16 to get everything in focus from near to far. And so if you're not doing focus stacking, you can do hyperfocal distance, which uh, I'm not going to get into it. It's very technical, but basically if you focus on the closest thing in your composition, your focus is going to be too near. And that means stuff in the background will be out of focus. If you focus on the background, then the stuff that's closer to you is going to be out of focus. So you want to focus on a point that's somewhere in between your foreground and your background. Uh, and that point needs to be closer to the foreground than to the background. So the rule of thumb that I typically use is I estimate the distance from my lens to the immediate foreground in my composition. And then I double that distance and I focus at that point. So if my foreground is a clump of wildflowers that are four feet away from the lens, roughly, I'm looking to focus on a point that's about eight feet away, and then I'll stop down to that small aperture to extend that depth of field, that zone of apparent sharpness to my foreground and my background. So focus stacking is a technique that takes all of that guesswork out of it. So focus stacking, 
you have a scene set up, you don't alter the composition or the exposure. All you do is you take multiple shots of the same scene focusing at different points. So you'll focus on the foreground, maybe on the middle ground, background, and then you'll use a focus stacking program to merge those files together. And the program will select the sharpest parts of each image and it will give you this blended image that's very sharp from near to far. So everything will be razor sharp in your final photograph. And it's a little bit better than doing the whole hyperfocal distance depth of field thing um, because you're just gonna end up with a sharper image overall. And you can also do more extreme perspectives. So a lot of times I might be, I don't know, six or seven inches away from my foreground. I'm really close because I've got a small foreground and I'm trying to make it bigger in the final composition. And when you're trying to get everything in focus from six inches away to six miles away, uh, depth of field alone probably isn't sufficient. So focus stacking can allow you to shoot these more extreme perspectives and still get everything tack sharp in the final photo. Yeah, those are great techniques to use. Uh, so you, you'd recommend using focus stacking probably more? Uh, I do that now. I, you know, if the longest time I did hyperfocal dis distance, uh, everyone should know how to do it because there might be times when you can't do a focus stack. Like if you're working on the coast and you've, you know, you're trying to incorporate incoming or outgoing waves, like dynamic elements, it can be very difficult to focus stack that when you've got a lot of moving parts so that each image is different from the next. And so knowing how to do hyperfocal distance focusing is a really good idea. And also if you've got very fast, changing light and you don't have time to do focus stacking, you'll want to do the old fashioned way. Uh, but definitely when I can slow down and when I don't have a lot of movement from image to image, that'll make it difficult to blend those images together later, I will do focus stacking. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And going back to the using the foreground element, I feel like that's like something that a lot of early photographers don't really think about too much because, you know, they probably take shots that are a little more uh, kind of two-dimensional in feel, and they don't have that strong foreground element. Um, but it really just does elevate your overall compositional style too. And I think it's it's counterintuitive to people who are beginning with landscape because they think, well, I'm out here to photograph that beautiful landscape. I'm here to photograph the Grand Tetons. Why would I use a wide-angle lens and make those look small? And so they end up taking out their short telephoto and they take shots of the mountains. And I think that at some point as your becoming better at photography, you look at those shots and realize they're not very interesting. They're kind of static. They seem very one dimensional. And so even though it's counterintuitive, going wide and bringing in that foreground will make the shots more visually compelling. It'll add that three dimensional feel that a photograph, you know, the photograph robs you of the third dimension that you can see with your eyes, you know, it takes away that depth. So you've got to create the illusion of depth in the two-dimensional final photograph that you're creating. And so having that foreground juxtaposed against that background, having that narrowing of perspective, that big foreground and a smaller background, that's going to help recreate that feeling of depth. So, you know, it is counterintuitive, but definitely I think it's the way to go. You, you know, you want to avoid making your background too small. And so you've got to find the right focal length or position relative to your background and make sure it's sized appropriately in the final composition. But it's okay if the that beautiful scenery in the background isn't front and center. It's okay if it's not the most prominent thing in the composition, because once you start working in those foreground shapes and then bringing in shapes in the sky created by the clouds and all that color that you might get at sunrise or sunset, uh, the composition becomes more than just the scenery, it becomes the entire visual experience that you have when you're out there. And that's the best way to show it to the viewers by going wide and incorporating these other visual elements. And would you say that usually kind of the ultimate goal of your foreground itself is to kind of lead the eye up the frame towards the background? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great way of putting it. If, if the foreground is not leading the eye to the background, if it's trapping the eye so that the eye doesn't want to go any further, or if it's you know, misdirecting the eye outside of the image frame or something like that, then it's not serving its its purpose. So it does have to kind of facilitate the viewer's journey. It doesn't have to point directly to the background. You don't need to have like a leading line that goes from foreground to background. Uh, you know, a foreground that kind of meanders through the composition, like maybe a foreground with an S curve or something like that, that that just kind of generally gets the eye moving around, but eventually points the eye to the background. That's the kind of foreground that you're looking for.